Hello. Okay, so we are live. Good evening to one and all. I am Himanshu Tucker from Team IEEE BVMSP, and I welcome you all to the second session of the International Tech Conclave (ITC 2020). Before going forward, Team IEEE BVMSP is electrified to announce that、uh, the upcoming event that is Blogathon. Blo the event Blogathon is about、uh, the participations. People around all around India and the globe, where people can write blogs and publish it, which, which could benefit them in their further business. Now we move forward, and now we move forward, and we have with us Mr. Roger Hunter, Program Manager at NASA, for a session on small spacecraft technologies and Kepler mission. Going forward, I would like to call Dr. Darshan Chak. Dr. Jagdish Rao, sir, faculty advisor, IEEE BVMSP, to take the proceedings further. Thank you, Himanshu. I am Dr. Jagdish Kumar. I am Rathod. I am、uh, working as an associate dean and associate professor at BVM Engineering College. I welcome all the participants to the International Tech Conclave 2020, ITC 2020. I am warmly welcome our speaker, Mr. Roger Hunter. For being here with us, who is a program manager at NASA, over four decades of experience in the Department of Defense, Commercial and Government Space Mission, he has served as a project and/or program manager for several important U.S. national missions, including the GPS, Clementine Two, Access Stein, the NASA Kepler missions, NASA Space Spacecraft Technology Program. His specialty is, is Air Force budgeting, business plans. Computer hardware, government acquisition process, GPS space system operations, sustainment and maintenance, project management, strategic planning, prototype development, aerospace industry. Now, without wasting much time, I would like to hand over the session to the Mr. Roger Hunter. Meanwhile, I request everyone to keep their microphone off to avoid disturbance when the session is going on. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to speak about two subjects today,、uh, and both of these subjects are at、uh, are missions that I have led、uh, and am leading at NASA. The first one is going to be the Small Spacecraft Technology Development Program. And I was asked to speak、uh, a little bit about Kepler, a mission that I had the opportunity and privilege to lead for over six years during my tenure at NASA as well. And I want to set the stage with giving you a quick overview of what NASA small spacecraft activities include. And the one I'll be speaking on the most is the block that's on the left, and that's space technology development. And the explore the explanation for each one of these categories, or whether it's space technology exploration or science, is written underneath that block. And I will highlight the one on space technology.、Uh, my office's Uh, mission and objective is to bring emerging and developing technologies out of laboratories, whether those laboratories are at academia, at small businesses, large businesses, and even in other NASA centers, and bring them to a maturity level that they can be infused into those missions you see on the right, in which we can conduct exploration or science missions with smaller spacecraft using the technologies that are developed. Under the block on the left. Now, the thing that I'm going to talk about、uh, in relation to that is what exactly are the objectives of my office and the Small Spacecraft Technology Program.、Uh, in many cases, it's to realize and instantiate the benefits of the technology and electronics revolution. What have they brought us to? Of course, as you have watched it over your time. Yeah, we know that、uh, there's been rapid advancements in processing capabilities, and we are also seeing the miniaturization of a number of things within a technology and electronics revolution. So we're taking advantage of that to try to lower the cost of missions and also reduce the time it takes to develop a spacecraft. At the same time, while we're realizing the development of these new technologies that, in some cases, are commercial off-the-shelf. Electronics and、uh, technology devices. In many cases, we find that we can use those in space, and so we're using them to create new mission architectures. But moreover, many cases 
the CubeSat class missions that I deal with and some of the SmallSat class missions that I deal with, we want to be, enable them to move beyond low Earth orbit, get them to further destinations, get them into cis lunar space, get them out to Mars, get them into planetary space and use them to either augment existing assets and missions or actually conduct science and exploration missions by themselves. So that sets the motivation for what the NASA Small Spacecraft Technology Program does. Where do we get the technology that helps us do that? And I just show four different pipelines here where that technology comes from. None of this should be a surprise to anyone. We get these from parts that we uh, enable with universities. We also conduct research with small businesses. We have public-private partnerships with industry, academia, and other U.S. government agencies as well. And we use those partnerships to try to infuse the results of those partnerships into future demonstration missions. And once we have demonstrated this technology on orbit and we've proved that it is a high technology readiness level, then we can turn it over to uh, the commercial industries that want to use it as they exploit space now for business purposes, or we can turn them over to the other centers within NASA that are conducting science and exploration missions. I would like to show you just one quick example. And looking at this chart, I mentioned we pair a lot with universities. We see a lot of good ideas coming from universities that are relevant to NASA's missions in science and explorations. And I don't want to dwell on this chart uh, much because I want to get into recently completed missions and upcoming missions or upcoming technology demonstration missions that we are used or conducting from my office. But this chart gives you a spread of the ideas where we're getting some of this, uh, these technologies from and how much money we're putting into this every year for developing of these technologies. The, uh, so far, we've, you know, 28 universities in 19 states, and that includes this class of um, uh, investments this year. And the results you can see on the left, in many cases, we use this as a means to stimulate uh, research within industries and also a means to inspire up and coming engineers that space is still a worthy place for operating and it's still a place where you can have a great career. The next chart just gives you a quick idea of the ones that we are awarded uh, this year. And many of these are relevant to the areas that we focus on to enable small spacecraft to move beyond low Earth orbit and out to that cislunar and planetary space. We're focusing on improving the, and uh, in, uh, making better the propulsion systems, the communication systems, the power processing subsystems, navigation systems, and processing systems on board the spacecraft. The more capable they are, they are, the more likely they will be used for some future science and exploration mission. And you can see the titles of some of the uh, proposals that were sent to us and the university from which that proposal came from. And then we when we award the grant to the university, we pair them with a NASA center. And in this case, we paired many of them this year with JPL, Johnson Space Center and Marshall Space Flight Center to give that university a mentor and also someone that they could also uh, seek advice from as they are enabling and conducting the research on the technologies that are listed in that title block. Now I want to talk about recently completed missions. And you see two spacecraft on this particular slide. And you can see uh, a hand, a human hand in there to give you a sense of scale for each of these missions. The one on the left is called ICERA. And it's a 3U CubeSat. And ICERA stands for Integrated Solar Array and Reflector Array Antenna. The purpose of this technology demonstration with this 3U size spacecraft was to show KA band communications capability from a small spacecraft such as the one you see there. And KA band communications is an area that small spacecraft had not used in the past, but now it's able to be infused into future small spacecraft in the future because we have demonstrated with a small spacecraft in low Earth orbit and it worked perfectly. Uh, as an aside, uh, when I ran the Kepler mission, 
the, the Kepler mission was the first time we had used KA band communications on a rather large spacecraft, and it worked perfectly. We actually had to upgrade the entire NASA deep space network with KA band communications so that uh, each antenna within the deep space network uh, for NASA could communicate with the Kepler telescope when it was on its nine and a half year mission. Now I'm going to show you some more slides in a minute that are relevant to ICERA because sometimes we try to be a little more agile in the way that we conduct these missions and as we were nearing the end of the development of that particular mission on the left, the Aerospace Corporation had finished a prototype of a 1U size, 1U being 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, a 1U size multispectral imager. And we had sufficient space on that ICERA spacecraft. They asked if we could include it into the spacecraft. And after consultations with JPL, we decided, yes, we could do it. And we would fly that uh, particular instrument for them. But we told them we did not want to enable the instrument and start conducting uh, measurements with it until we were completed with the demonstration of that integrated solar array and reflector array antenna. Now that antenna is kind of neat because you can see it, there's, a, there's these patterns on it. Uh, it is not a typical concave antenna, it's a flat panel. That particular style antenna was placed on two CubeSats that went to Mars, and you may be familiar with that mission called MARCO, uh, and those two CubeSats escorted the InSight lander to Mars, and as the InSight lander was making its entry and descent and landing onto the Martian surface, the, the CubeSats using that antenna were able to relay communications on that entry, descent, and landing operation while the InSight lander was making its entry into the Martian atmosphere and making its final landing on the Martian surface. So the antenna works. Uh, in that case, however, Marco was communicating at X-band and we were using this one in particular just for a KE-band communication. So that was the only difference. Uh, in a moment, I'm gonna show you some of the images that were taking, taken with that 1U multispectral imager which um, I believe the Aerospace Corporation, the acronym they have for that one, one U multispectral imager was Cumulos. So you may hear me use that term on the next couple of slides after I finish describing the other mission that's on this particular slide. Now the one you see on the right is called the Optical Communications and Sensor Demonstration. That's one of the two that we built and they were twins, they were exactly alike. And that is a one and a half U size uh, spacecraft. And it was just going to be the first time we were going to demonstrate laser communications from a small spacecraft from low Earth orbit. We had demonstrated laser comm only once before from a much larger spacecraft from the moon. And that uh, spacecraft was called Laddie. And that was uh, also one way communications and uh, it was uh, a simple demonstration of uh, about 50 megabits per second from the moon and we actually transmitted from the moon i think it was one of the star wars movies we demonstrated which i found rather amusing that we would, we would do that but that particular uh, spacecraft on the right was crammed full of technologies it had just about everything you need that has uh, that is you find today in a much larger spacecraft it had a propulsion system on board of course it has a power system it had the uh, laser comm, it had GPS and attitude determination and control system, it had reaction wheels, it had about everything you see on a larger spacecraft today, except this is a much smaller package. And I will show you something with that one in a minute as well. Now, there are, as I mentioned, there are two of those on the right. And uh, the reason there were two, both of them, of course, were capable of optical spacecraft uh, or optical communications. But since both of them also had propulsion systems on board, a secondary objective was to show proximity operations of those two spacecraft around each other. Now let's start talking about some of the things that uh, we saw. Uh, it, once again, the one on the left, ICERA, we finished the KA band demonstrations. <clears throat> With that, it worked successfully. We were able to show 100 megabits uh, per second data transmission from that spacecraft. 
uh, the ground antenna was a simple one in Southern California and it worked perfectly. And uh, then we turned on the multispectral imager that was on ICERA that the Aerospace Corporation brought to us. Uh, and we took a number of images with it. And the one you're looking at right now, uh, we were about 450 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And you may have read in some of the international news about the terrible forest fires that we had in Northern California in late 2018. And this photograph you see here is of <clears throat> the so-called Camp Fire. Uh, in they named these fires after a road or some other um, uh, ob some other object that's known in the area. And the campfire was this one that you see on this page. Now, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if you look on the one on the right, and I'm circling an object that's right in the middle of that uh, image that is presented on the left side of the slide here, that is the burning embers of the town of paradise so it's rather sobering to see this as we're coming up over california at night with these spacecraft and we're taking these images and then when you process the image and you can see this and that uh, town of about eighteen thousand people was wiped off the face of the earth by this horrible forest fire and here we were looking at it with this one and a half few spacecraft and we could see the burning embers of the town so it was rather sobering uh, that you could see uh, this kind of detail uh, with a small spacecraft. Now, I would like to show you a demonstration of um, the optical communications and sensor demonstration uh, activity. This is uh, a animation that shows the deployment of two spacecraft. And as you see here, you can see some water being spouted out of the spacecraft and uh, demonstrating its water propulsion system. And then you see the animation of the laser being fired at the Earth. And actually, we were aiming at an optical telescope uh, that's on top of the uh, Aerospace Corporation building, which is in El Segundo, California. And that's just south of Los Angeles International Airport. And uh, to give you an appreciation of uh, the ability of hitting that target, we were coming up uh, over the rim of the Earth in the, at night and we're still, as I mentioned, uh, al almost at 450 kilometers as well. And the optical telescope that was the target for the spacecraft is a, just a little 30 centimeter telescope. And as we're coming up and we start lasing the target, of course, the spacecraft are slewing using the little reaction wheels on board to maintain the pointing and tracking accuracy, we were able to hit that target quite well every time. And uh, we were doing it at night. And this is uh, just a little six watt laser and it's operating at the um, 1064 nanometer um, uh, wavelength. And we were able to do it not only at night, but I challenged the team is can we do it late in the afternoon? And uh, they succeeded. And so that was an additional credit that uh, we achieved with the mission. We did something that was not, uh, it, at the beginning of the mission, it was not required, but we wanted to see if we were capable of doing it. In many cases, that's what we attempt to do with some of the technology demonstrations that we have on orbit. If we, uh, with the engineers and scientists come up with some additional objectives that we hadn't thought of before, we actually end up conducting those demonstrations. Now, I have on the screen in front of you, I want to show you a demonstration that occurred between the two missions that I have been talking about. Remember the ICERA, which has, uh, we demonstrated the KE band communications, and I talked about the cumulus sensor that's on board that spacecraft, that 1U multispectral imager. We wondered if we could hit that cumulus sensor with one of the lasers on the OCSD, <clears throat> excuse me, on the OCSD demonstration. And could we maintain pointing as uh, the, the two spacecraft were moving in orbit? Uh, we knew exactly where they were. And in this demonstration, uh, they were about 2,200 kilometers apart. Now, of course, to set this up, you can see the limb of the Earth on the right, 
And if um, I'm going to start the animation, and you'll see a object going from about the 10 o'clock position to about the 4 o'clock position. That is not <laughs> it is not an unidentified flying object. It's actually a hot star radiating strongly that the cumulus uh, payload on board ICERA was seeing. Well, what you'll see light up in the very middle of the screen is the six watt laser from OCSD at a distance of 2200 kilometers. And I'm going to run the animation uh, probably twice. So hopefully you'll be able to see this and you'll see the IR star moving as you can see it. And then right in the middle where my cursor was, you see that uh, laser light up. Of course, this animation sped up quite a bit. We were able to do that several times and in that demonstration you saw here and I will run it again for you. Uh, we were aiming just to sweep the laser across the focal plane of the cumulo sensor. We did some other tests in which we actually were able to maintain pointing for almost three minutes at the object without losing uh, contact between the two with that laser at a distance of still about 2200 kilometers, which was rather amazing uh, that we were able to do this with these small spacecraft. Now, I, I will tell you an amusing story. Uh, before I leave this chart. NASA thought this was kind of cool that uh, we were able to do this as sort of an extra credit between two missions, which we had no intention of conducting any joint operations with, but we did. <clears throat> so we posted this uh, little video on NASA's Twitter account and added some additional explanation on what the readers were seeing. And you may have heard of the so-called Flat Earth Society well, they commented on it saying this was all fake news from NASA. And you could, they said the Earth is flat. So this limb that NASA put on here on this screen, and that's fake and it's not real. And I think a couple of our NASA public affairs officers engaged with them and sort of taunted them a little bit. But we thought it was kind of amusing uh, that uh, this technology demonstration of just two um, small spacecraft was drawing that kind of interest from the Flat Earth Society when we posted this on the NASA main Twitter feed. Now I'll go on and talk about some other upcoming uh, technology demonstrations. And the ones that I'm going to be talking about, these are all going to be flying over the next two and three years. And a number of these we have, uh, we're getting ready to get on a launch pad now. But of course, uh, as you are aware, uh, we are also being impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. In some cases, uh, there are some activities and operations that are being uh, delayed by that and impacted by it. Uh, there are some missions, though, that uh, if they are, one, uh, resupplying the International Space Station, uh, those missions continue, but we take extra precautions to ensure that uh, the uh, workers who are working on a mission are protected against any potential exposure uh, and secondly, if there's another mission, for example, the next rover we're sending to Mars is called Perseverance, which is supposed to launch in July and has a tight window. Uh, the work continues on that too. But uh, these technology demonstrations, uh, like I'm working on now with my team, some of them are starting to see some impacts from the COVID-19. And I got a couple of things I want to add at the end to show you um, some additional information on the COVID-19 impact on all of us. But let's talk about these two uh, missions we have up on the screen now. The first one is called the PTD or Pathfinder Technology Demonstration. There are a series of these. There are six buses we buy and the technology we're distributing is not in the bus. We reserve three U of that six U bus to demonstrate a new type of technology. And I've listed a number of them across the bottom of this page for you. Some of these are demonstrations of new propulsion systems that will perhaps improve the capabilities of these small spacecraft. Some of them, uh, for example, like number one, have the hydros water-based thruster. And some, of course, are associated with better communications capabilities. Number three, uh, you can see listed here is a high bandwidth laser communications. Uh, I mentioned on OCSD, we achieved 200 megabits per second in that demonstration. Well, in number three, the T-Bird demonstration, we're actually aiming for 200 gigabits per second. So we're upping our game quite a bit. And when it comes to laser comm and the, uh, the amount of information we can transfer from a spacecraft to a ground station. 
Number two is uh, a device being built by Blue Canyon Technologies. It's a so-called hyper-exact attitude determination control, so it's going to give us better capabilities to point spacecraft because, as you know, with missions, uh, pointing is a key element of conducting an operation because you want to be able to point accurately enough at your target when you are observing it or point accurately enough at your ground antenna or, or optical receiver on the ground when you're receiving the data. Uh, number four is another reflector ray antenna that uh, work at, we're working with JPL on that one, and that one has the ability to not provide uh, just communications, but also perhaps a radar capability. And number five uh, is called LISA T. That stands for Lightweight Integrated Solar Array Transceiver. And um, it'll only use about one U of space of that three U space available on that PTD bus that you see on the left. Now that one U space, this uh, lightweight integrated uh, solar array transceiver, if you can imagine, I'm sure you know, uh, you're familiar with origami. Maybe some of you may have tried doing some origami. I, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> I fail. Um, but this lightweight integrated solar array transceiver, it folds up like a, an origami flower and you can fold it into the one U space of that PTD bus. And when you're on orbit, it uh, you open the door on that one U space and this thing unfurls. And um, testing so far indicates that we can probably get 600 watts of power out of that, which is rather amazing um, that we're, we're moving the technology along that well. So that one is, gives you an idea of PTD and um, five payloads that we are going to fly. I mentioned there will be a series of six. We do have a spare we're building, uh, but we are also going to fly it as well. The spare, of course, is used uh, in uh, integra assembly integration and test activities on the ground that support the other five that will go up, but we are also going to fly the spare and take advantage of a spacecraft that is essentially a whole spacecraft, so why not use it? Now, let's talk about CPOD on the right. It stands for CubeSat for Proximity Operations Demonstration. Uh, that particular mission is also involves two spacecraft, and you see the two there, and they're docked together, uh, and that'll be the final configuration at the end of the demonstration. But the intent is to demonstrate, as you can see in the caption below the photograph, demonstrate the rendezvous proximity operations and docking of two three u size CubeSats. And it's supposed to be autonomous docking. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to this demonstration. And you can imagine, uh, if, you, if you can extrapolate with your imagination, how you might use this for future missions. You may, for example, use one of these to uh, conduct inspections around a space station autonomously uh, and not have to put an astronaut outside to go do inspections or preventive maintenance inspections for anything that you may want to uh, fix on your space station. You could also use uh, these autonomous docking operations if you want to build larger structures and you have all these things flying around and docking and building a much larger uh, aperture, for example. Now I'm going to show you some other ones that we're working on that are coming up, and I'll talk about these left to right. Uh, V-Rex. Um, you can see they're depicted three one-U size spacecraft. Uh, this is a risk reduction mission that we're going to fly in support of the mission you see on the far right called Starling, and I'll talk about that last. But V-Rex is a three low-power, low-cost spacecraft that are going to demonstrate, as you can see, they're listed ranging topology recovery and coordinated measurement technologies. Uh, and it's a risk reduction for future spacecraft in swarm demonstrations or swarm missions. And I'll talk about the swarming when I get to the one on the right, because that's a particular area that I'm uh, quite interested in. Um, Click, the second one from the left. Uh, those are uh, two three U size spacecraft as well. Now, I mentioned OCSD earlier, the Optical Communications and Sensor Demonstration. And that one was just demonstrating laser comm from the spacecraft to the ground. This time, with this demonstration, we're going to demonstrate laser communications between the spacecraft, uh, and they will be sharing information. Now, this one has a lower data rate, uh, and, and that's okay, but the purpose is to show that you can let the spacecraft find each other and then demonstrate that they can transfer by optical crosslink information between the two of them 
and up to a range of about 580 kilometers. Number three, uh, when I had a short tag up with some students yesterday and the question about solar cells came up, and I think the question was, do they have some utility? The NASA is looking into solar cells as a means of moving around the solar system. And uh, I think there's been a couple that demonstrated before and they've had uh, sort of ambiguous success. I think I don't know all the details of the history, but find those two. But um, this is one we're building. Uh, and the demonstration is not in the sailing material itself. It's in the composite booms that are used to unfurl the sail. Now, when we launch this, which is uh, still on schedule for next year, and I don't know how much the COVID-19 impact is going to have on the schedule, but when uh, we get this on orbit, and it's a 12 u spacecraft, and you can see it um, is tiny, of course, in the middle of uh, that solar cell, and then the cell itself is about 81 square meters. You may be able to see this uh, with a naked eye if the right uh, angle hits uh, with sunlight late in, uh, in the early evening. Uh, you may get a glimpse of this because it's going to be a rather large solar cell, but NASA is already proposing another one that would be used for a mission, and I think it's called the Solar Clipper but it'll be you know, at least 10 times larger than this cell. And I don't know all the details on that particular mission yet. I hear it's being formulated. So I would uh, recommend just standing by for news on that one. But I think they're waiting to see how well the composites on this particular cell work as they get ready to build that much larger uh, mission called Solar Clipper. I think that's the name it's going to be used for. Now, finally, the one on the right is called Starling. Um, shown there are three spacecraft it's actually going to be four and these will be six u size spacecraft and the purpose is to demonstrate collaborating uh spacecraft that are autonomously talking with each other and they are doing something called cluster flight management um, and they're also showing ad hoc development of communications networks between a swarm of spacecraft and repair of the, the communication network. If, for example, you show that one drops out and the other three recognize it has dropped out and they reroute their communications just between the three of them if another one drops out. But the primary purpose is to show that these spacecraft can communicate with each other and also stay in a formation with each other. Now, these are communicating by RF. Um, the intent in this case is when the four spacecraft are moving along, uh, all four are talking with each other continuously. And if one starts drifting outside of the RF communications, the other three, the other three realize it and they communicate with it and they tell it which way to move because they all have propulsion systems on board to cause it to come back into the cluster flight itself so that they all stay together. Now you can think about you know, what are the applications of a swarm mission. In many cases, um, you do this for multi-point science data collection. If you want to put a swarm of spacecraft around a large asteroid and you want to learn more about it, this is a, a one way of doing it. So we're investigating the, the foundational operational concepts for these and also the foundational technologies that might be used to inform a NASA mission in the future in which a swarm of small spacecraft uh, would uh, help the mission uh, better. So that's one thing we're doing with, uh, that's the primary purpose of Starling. Now, I'm, I'm talk about a couple more that I think are, uh, they're moving along very well. Uh, and this represents um, our upcoming lunar exploration missions and uh, the, the roadmap for getting a sustained presence on the surface of the moon. The one you see on the left it's called Lunar Flashlight. It is a six u size spacecraft. And this one will launch with Artemis when Artemis launches in late 2021. There are actually 13 other, I mean, 13 total small spacecraft um, like this one that are also gonna be launched on that particular uh, rocket in the, the latter half of 2021. And as Artemis, is flying Orion around the moon and bringing Orion back to Earth in a splashdown of reentry. This spacecraft you see on the left, called Lunar Flashlight, 
is going to be injected into lunar orbit. It has a laser uh, on uh, its uh, as its payload, and the intent uh, it will be the laser to illuminate a number of the darkest craters on the moon and discern where the uh, ice deposits in those darkest craters are. Uh, and there's a the laser head actually has it's in the near infrared, and there's four bands within that near infrared, and so the light will be reflected off the bottom of the crater back up to the spacecraft. And we should be able to discern regolith versus water ice deposits. And so we're trying to get a better idea of the quantity and distribution of those surface ice deposits using just a 6U spacecraft. Now, the one on the right is this is, um, it's actually bigger than a 12U. What you see depicted here is a 12U spacecraft, but you may see that odd thing that's sitting off on the top of it pointing toward the moon, and that's a, an antenna housing. It's, so it's, uh, it's supposed to be a typical 12U spacecraft, but we ended up having to put the antenna uh, farm, if you will, on top of the spacecraft to uh, build this particular mission. This one uh, is one of the fastest missions that we're going to fly from the authority to proceed, which was in August 31st of last year. We intend to launch this in February of next year, and this includes buying its own rocket. Incidentally, uh, we're actually going to launch this on one of Rocket Lab's electron rockets. They have come up with an ingenious kick stage, which after you use some interesting uh, gravity assist maneuvers, we can actually get this into an orbit that is referred to as the near rectilinear halo orbit. Now, when I was um, at the beginning of this mission, I was, I'd never heard of a near rectilinear halo orbit. Or so I did some research and why are we doing this? And now, oh, it became obvious. <laughs> the near rectilinear halo orbit is actually where we're going to put the next space station called Gateway, Lunar Gateway. But no one has ever flown in that orbit before. And so NASA said, we need to go put a spacecraft in that orbit and make sure that it's math mathematically it's stable before we put the gateway there. And that's what the purpose of this uh, mission is going to do. Now, how does it do it? Uh, after we get injected into the near rectilinear halo orbit, after we are kicked off with the third stage from that Rocket Lab Electron rocket, and we use the gravity assist maneuvers to get into it, that antenna you see on top is gonna to start ranging with uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is still orbiting the moon today and has been since 2009, and also ranging with the DSN antennas uh, on Earth. And that will help us characterize the near rectilinear halo orbit and uh, prove its stability as we march forward and um, get ready to start building the gateway space station that will go into that same orbit. And uh, if you're interested in that, there's a, there's a couple of demonstrations on YouTube that show you some good animations on a near rectilinear halo orbit. And I think we're going to be putting some more out there that are a little bit better than the ones that are on YouTube right now. But they're pretty, there's some good uh explanations on what a near, near rectilinear halo or orbit is and uh, it's kind of intriguing to me so i i want to use this next slide as a transition because uh, some students wanted me to talk about kepler and i do want to do that but this is just uh, just an overview of much of the information i told you uh, and this is what we're trying to do with small spacecraft technology and i will just show you quickly this is just a notional uh, is a schedule chart that we're using. And you see we're quite busy with a number of these missions. And I talked about a lot of these, including down to lunar flashlight. There's some other ones that are coming up that you'll hear more about in the future. Uh, but you could see with all the little triangles represent the launches I have a small spacecraft demonstration. So we're gonna be quite busy within the small spacecraft technology program, provided we can work our way through uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and we'll be able to come out the other side and we'll continue these missions because we would like to see these completed and the technologies they're demonstrating infused into future NASA science or exploration missions. Now with that, I'd like to talk about Kepler. I, uh, this mission to me has, it's a very personal. Um, when I was a kid growing up, you know, and you as well, you always look up in the sky and uh, 
you start wondering what else is out there. And uh, in this case, we were wondering, is there another Earth? And what is the menagerie of planets that occupy our Milky Way galaxy and for all intents and purposes, all the other galaxies that we become aware of with all of our telescopes with Hubble and, and Spitzer and then and soon uh, the successor to Hubble, which will be the James Webb Space Telescope. But uh, this mission was recently completed. Uh, we decommissioned the spacecraft in November 2018 after its launch in March of 20, um, in 2009. So in its nine and a half year mission, it has essentially revolutionized um, what we know about exoplanets. Uh, of course, once you start learning some of the things that we have discovered with Kepler, it raises more questions. And uh, this cartoon that you see here is indicative of how we find the planets and we use transit photometry. In this case, you wait and watch for planets to go across the face of the host star. And you watch that, uh, you stare and you stare and you stare and you watch that to happen. And just like planet Earth, if you're standing on the edge of our solar system and you're looking back at our sun and you have the right kind of uh, optics, you will see the Earth go across the face of the sun once every 365 days. And as you're staring at it, it takes about 12 hours for it to go across the face of the sun. And it says, well, let's do the same thing, except let's point the spacecraft out at the cosmos and see what we can find. Now, this is the area that we searched. This was Kepler's original field of view. And, um, and you see that uh, those that square looking object and that is represents the photometer of Kepler. It was a rather large instrument. At the time we launched it, this was the biggest camera we'd ever put inside a spacecraft before. It had 96 million pixels. And its sole intent was look for planets. And this is the area that we picked. And this is where we looked for the first four years. And we would probably have continued looking there for the entire nine and a half year mission of the orbit. But of course, we suffered a malfunction. And I will talk a little bit about that as we get into this discussion. But um, that 96 million pixels found um, many planets. And so let's talk about the results. And I love showing this chart in the next one because it gives you this visual impact of how successful this mission was. And so this was Kepler's first full frame image. And um, those three little yellow dots that you see there were known planets that had already been discovered by other means, probably radial velocity that we knew existed and were in Kepler's field of view in the area that we were gonna search. And so in the first four years, this is what we found. And the planets just covered the entire uh, area. They're everywhere. And we have to date, and I've updated this, over 4,700 planet candidates, about half of those have been confirmed. And my uh, estimation is that, uh, and what I'm hearing from the mission scientists who worked on Kepler is many of these are going to end up being confirmed in the end. To me, that was astonishing. And you can see the, the legend on the left here, we color coded this. Of course, the ones we're most interested in is the Earth sized planets because we humans can be an arrogant species and we want to mirror image ourselves on the rest of the cosmos. And so when we say when we'll look for another Earth, we assume that, well, the planets that are going to, you know, likely harbor life are going to be the ones about our size and they're going to be at the right distance from their host star, that they can have the right temperature. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, and water can pool on the surface of the planet because we know water is a vital ingredient for life on this planet. I mean, this planet still is the only one we found with the abundance and diversity of life that we have ever seen, but we still haven't found the other Earth that, if you want to think about it, is an exact duplicate of this one. And there may not be an exact duplicate of this one. Life is interesting. And, you know, nature is going to create planets any way that nature wants to do them. And we have found gobs of planets out there, and there are giant planets much bigger than Jupiter. And we found planets that are as small as our moon. And there are planets we found orbiting two stars, just like Luke Skywalker's home Tatooine in that Star Wars movie. And we have found that there are uh, odd things in the galaxy. 
we have found five stars orbiting each other in within the galaxy. Of course, everything is gravitationally bound, but we found it interesting that we'd have five stars that are orbiting each other. There are two in the middle that are doing a dance, and there's two going around those two, and then there's another singular star going around those four. So there is a lot of unknowns in the galaxy, but that's why we're here. That's what makes us human. We are curious about our surroundings, and that's what helps us progress because we remain curious. Now, having said that, I want to show you just some uh, data charts. And ones I'll, I'll point out to you things that I would like you to most be aware of. I just pulled this off of the, the exoplanet website that uh, NASA runs to give you the current count. The one you want to pay attention to is in the middle. The candidates and confirmed planets in the capital is all. And this is uh, all the planets that are, that are in there that are um, at the right distance that they have the same, if you will, insulation or earth flux from the host star. It's 361. 361 um, habitable zone planets. And of course, a number of those are Earth size. I think it's a couple of dozen, maybe three dozen now that are Earth size, but you know, larger planets, <clears throat> if they have moons and those larger planets are in the habitable zone, so are their moons. So there have been, as I've indicated before, over 4,700 total candidates and confirmed planets from the Kepler mission itself. Now, I mentioned earlier that that field of view we stared at for four years, we would continue staring at that, but we suffered uh, a couple of malfunctions on the spacecraft, one in its third year and one in its fourth year. And we lost two of the four reaction wheels on Kepler, and we needed those reaction wheels to point accurately at this original same field of view. And when that second one failed, uh, we thought we were done. Um, we thought we had lost the mission but an ingenious engineer, and never underestimate you know, engineers uh, at NASA or some of the, our partners, uh, came up with an ingenious way to still point the spacecraft, even with the loss of two reaction wheels, by using the solar wind pressure as another balancing arm for the spacecraft. We could not point at the original field of view, but we still could point accurate enough and point the spacecraft at other areas and still find planets. And what you see here, <clears throat> we call it K2, uh, the second part of the Kepler mission. You know, some people say, well, the K2 means the second part of the mission. Some people say, eh, it says K2 because we only have two reaction wheels left. <clears throat> Doesn't matter to me. We're still finding planets. And you can see we found a number of planets with the K2 mission. And the thing that spelled the end of Kepler was when we ran out of propellant uh, at the end of nine and a half years. So we decommissioned the spacecraft. In November 2018, um, the data are still out there for anyone to look in. They're public. And if you want to go, uh, if you're interested in exoplanet science, uh, there was another planet that just announced within the last couple of months. Another one that was in the original Kepler field of view that originally some people thought was a false positive. And after some additional analysis and better processing in the data, uh, some scientists announced that they had yet found another Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone, and it was something that was buried within the original Kepler data that was missed in the beginning. So I think these numbers are still going to go up. Uh, how much more are they going to go up? I, I, I wouldn't venture a guess, but it seems to me that there's still probably, from what I'm hearing, there's likely still some more planets that are yet to be found. Now, <clears throat> this one chart I'm going to show you is only because I want to mention the mission called TESS. Kepler originally was pointing at one particular part of the galaxy far and deep through that Cygnus constellation. It was so successful, we uh, NASA built another mission called TESS, Transiting Exoplanet Satellite Survey, um, which was intended to be a follow-on to Kepler, but have a different uh, viewing field than Kepler, as opposed to looking far and deep. This was going to look closer in in our own stellar neighborhood out to, you know, 35 to 75 light years from us and find uh, all the Earth-sized habitable zone planets in that space. And you can see the number of planets have also been found by TESS. And uh, they have yet, you can see on the bottom line, uh, 1,118 candidates yet to be confirmed. So they're working on confirming those. 
and there are uh, they're going to confirm some you know uh, Earth's own habitable zone planets as well. Uh, and they've only so far they've only confirmed 45, but they're working still detecting planets. They're still working to confirm these. So there's been an advance in exoplanet science, and um, and people have been finding planets. Uh, and I remember the, when the first ones were announced back in um, the the 1990s, and it was scintillating. It was titillating because we always thought there's other planets out there, but then one was confirmed. And then imaginations took off um, about what else could be found, and that was when Bill Baruki, the principal investigator, started pushing papers about how you would find uh, planets using transit photometry, and that's how Kepler was born. And it actually has turned out to be the most successful way of finding planets so far. But I'm sure that there will be other you know, missions to come that will explore the planets that uh, Kepler has detected, of course, remotely. We want to understand more about you know, any of these planets that we think are in the habitable zone of their host star, what is in the atmosphere? We finally have one. And uh, you may have missed it in the announcement is back in September, I was giving a talk in Atlanta, Georgia, and NASA had just announced the uh, detection of water vapor in the atmosphere of one of the Kepler discovered planets. And that, Kepler, that planet is called Kepler's K218b, and that was astonishing. Um, it's still about what I think, if I remember correctly, about 124 light years away from us. Yet, using Hubble and the Spitzer Space Telescopes, uh, the two of those combined were able to discern that there was water in the atmosphere of that planet using um, uh, spectrographic analysis. Now. I want to leave you a, a couple of images before I jump off of here, and I do want to say something about COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this is one of the last uh, full-frame images that we took with Kepler before we retired to spacecraft. And of course, Kepler is not an imaging spacecraft. It is a photometer. It measures light very precisely. And what you're seeing here is an image of the Earth. Uh, Kepler was about 94, 95 million a watt miles away from Earth when we turned it toward this. And it's sort of the goodbye uh, picture uh, with Kepler looking back at his maker. And uh, your little bulge you see on the left is actually the moon was uh, behind the Earth at the time. So you got a little additional light coming off of this image. And of course, you got the vertical beam because the circuitry lit up like crazy once we uh, turned this toward Earth, and it was very bright, as you can see. So Kepler was one of the most sensitive instruments we've ever built or, or used to detect planets. Now, um, I don't know uh, when humans will walk on Mars. Of course, we've been on Homo sapiens have been walking around for a couple hundred thousand years or so. but. Um, we want to get to the point where we can get better images of those exoplanets. And this is just a representation of what Earth looks like from the Cassini spacecraft. And this image was taken back in 2014 as Cassini was rounding the backside of Saturn. And then we told it, look over your shoulder and take that picture. And the arrow was pointing toward the Earth-Moon system. And that's how we look from a, a billion miles away. Now, I've talked about a lot of uh, exoplanets that Kepler has discovered. <clears throat> and um, humans have walked on the moon, but no human has walked on Mars yet. But we do know what um, images from another planet do look like. And these are real images of a sunrise on Mars, noon at Mars, and evening sunset on Mars, and also a night sky with Mars with its two moons. And these are taken by our rovers. Will humans ever walk on exoplanets? Not in my lifetime, likely not in yours either. Uh, there's, we just don't have the capability. We don't have the technology today to travel to a number of those planets that Kepler has detected. I mean, it's hard enough getting out to uh, our own planets in our own solar system. Uh, we have only um, five spacecraft that I say we've, uh, we've launched, if you will, toward the stars, even though that's not what their original mission was. They went to explore other planets within our solar system. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 have reached interstellar space, Pioneer 10 and 11, and now New Horizons, which is the spacecraft that went to, that did the flyby of Pluto, uh, 
all five of those spacecraft will exit the solar system with Voyager 1 already having done so, at least it's beyond the helipause. Uh, and they will continue their journey at infinitum for thousands of years until something, uh, who knows what, will come across their path. But I want to, I mentioned earlier, I want to talk about uh, COVID-19 because one of the students asked me the other day about what's the impact that we're seeing with COVID-19. And it's interesting that we can observe uh, the impacts of humans on the earth directly and indirectly. So the image I'm showing you uh, is one I found fascinating. And it was taken by an astronaut on board the International Space Station a few years ago. And what you're looking at is, um, that's Bangkok, all the city lights of Bangkok uh, at night. And when Reed uh, Weissman took this photograph, he was the astronaut who took it and they were coming up over the Gulf of Thailand at night in the International Space Station. He was wondering what the green lights were out in the middle of the water. What is that? Um, and uh, some people thought he didn't know and some people guess it was bioluminescence, but it isn't. It's fishing fleets. And uh, the fishing fleets use these very bright green lights to lure the krill and smaller fish up so they can catch the bigger fish. And so this goes on night after night after night. And uh, so you see this is a, um, an indication or a visible signature from space of human activity on the surface of the earth at night with the city lights and the fishing fleets. But now let's talk about uh, something that's a little more, uh, even more recent, because this photograph was taken, like I said, a few years ago. And let's look at, um, at India as a result of what's going on with uh, in India with uh, your shutdowns there and your sheltering in place as a result of COVID-19. And um, I have left some words on here. You can actually find this. There's a link I've put there that you can look at from the Earth Observatory, NASA. And what you're seeing is uh, a reduction in um, uh, optical, uh, in pollution and particles that uh, as a result of if less traffic, as a result of people sheltering in place and not moving around as much. And you can see the so-called 2020 anomaly uh, in which you can see a reduction in those aerosols uh, in that particular area. We see it, it not just uh, over India, but we see it in the United States too. And what you're looking at here is the same uh, type of data. And on the left is the average uh, detection of aerosols in 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2019. And the one you see on the right is 2020, because uh, that part of the United States, in New York and New Jersey, uh, were very hard hit by the COVID-19. And so with shelter in place there, you could see less traffic uh, on the surface of the earth and, and also less pollution. So I would see these and I, you wonder, is this, are we seeing a glimpse of something else? Of course, the pandemic is very serious and um, we'll come out the other side of this one day, I'm sure of it, but we're dealing with this right now and will be for some time as we get to know more about this virus and how to combat it and one of the best tools we have right now is social distancing but of course vaccines are being worked on and you look at these images though and i look at this and i say is this a, a glimpse of a world without uh, with less dependence on fossilized fuels because uh, this is essentially what you're seeing other than the reduction in human activity people moving less and traveling less and using less fossil fuel now, I mentioned COVID-19 having impacts on NASA missions. Um, the ones that do continue are the ones that resupply the International Space Station and those that have to meet a narrow launch window. And um, this uh, image you see here is an image of the next rover we're sending to Mars. And so the COVID-19 uh, epidemic is not slowing this down. Of course, we're taking extra precautions with the, the the NASA scientists and engineers who are preparing for this launch. But uh, I wanted to you know, show you this image because uh, that's the Perseverance rover in the background. Of course, it looks a lot like Curiosity, but it has some different instruments on it. Uh, you can Google it online if you're interested in knowing what the additional instruments are that Perseverance has as opposed to what Curiosity has. But we're going to fly a helicopter in the Martian atmosphere for the first time. And uh, that's what you see there in the front, and it's, uh, it's small, um, and it's going to you know, be RF linked to the rover. 
and it's solar powered. Uh, but I found it amusing when just looking at this image that it reminds me of a CubeSat, <laughs> well, which I've become quite familiar with. And um, this is a uh, plan on launch in um, uh, July of this year. And after it makes its several months journey out to Mars and it makes its entry, descent and landing, goes through all the checkout activities. At some time, the helicopter will detach from the Perseverance rover and begin its mission. And it'll be the first time that um, we have flown an object uh, through the atmosphere at Mars. And uh, I think I will stop there and um, gone almost exactly an hour, which I think is what I, I plan to do. And um, I thank you for your time. I think there's supposed to be a question uh, session now. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just before the session, uh, there's something we have to show our people over there. So okay. we are glad that IEEE BVMSP has organized its flagship event, Blogathon, personal development for smart people, national level blog writing, blog writing competition. This event is specially organized to promote professionalism among the students and spread awareness about blog writing. The submissions that we'll be considering are not limited to only technical blogs, but you can also submit blogs written on the non-tech aspects of the world. The winners will be getting an assured price and they will be featured on IEEE BVM newsletter and website. This event will be live till 6th May and yes, the registrations have already started. So we request you to endorse this competition, all the interested ones and engage them in this fun learning competition. Further, the links are given in the chat section. Now, moving ahead for our Q&A section, uh, I request my moderators to let the time continue the questions in the chat section so that not just okay. Request Roger sir to kindly go back to the Webex portal. Uh, we have the questions in the chat section. Mm, okay. I'm looking for that part. One moment. Now moving ahead for our Q&A section. I'm stop sharing my screen. So below there's an application, I guess, Webex one, we can make it, I guess that would work. Uh, as I'm looking for it, can you just uh, read me the first one so I can uh, answer a couple of them? I'm trying to find a cat section. Uh, sure, sir. I request the moderators, please uh, ask okay, the sure. question. Hello. Oh, here I said, uh, here's one. Um, I read from an article that small spacecraft technologies are used to make models of similar bigger projects. So isn't it possible to do such models in software-based simulations? Um, uh, I guess the answer to that would be probably yes. Um, we do model uh, a lot of our missions in software. And uh, in many cases, we actually want to build a software model before we even build some of our small spacecraft, just to make sure that the flight software going to be, that we're going to be using on the spacecraft works properly. Uh, it, there is, 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 it's an interesting question because in some cases, when we think about building a mission, um, a lot of people already gravitate to a larger spacecraft, but I think now people are realizing that you can use smaller spacecraft to accomplish some of the same missions. So it becomes, a, a, in many cases, uh, a question of what is the target of interest that you want to go after and what is the most optimal way to explore the project, explore the target, given the technologies that you have today. And there are, uh, there's a debate, I, that's, debate is not the right word. I think there's a dialogue going on within NASA 
And I think more and more people are starting to embrace the idea of using smaller spacecraft to conduct a number of missions. And we're starting to see that already. Uh, uh, we saw it with the Marco spacecraft that was going out to Mars and escorting the InSight lander. And uh, the, of course, the objective of the spacecraft was rather limited. You know, all it did was relay the entry, descent, and landing signals from the lander making it onto the Martian surface in the inside you know, and the space two of them one is a backup to the other in case one failed um, and that was their only role however you go look at other missions today that NASA is conducting called Cygnus now they're bigger than CubeSats but they're still small that class size they're you know less than 100 kilograms each but and there was eight of them and they're doing some sort of meteorological measurements around uh, the Earth, uh, particularly for looking at the uh, getting better measurements on hurricanes and typhoons. There are, uh, there are companies that have formed now that they have embraced small spacecraft for their business model. You, I'm sure you've heard of the company called Planet, uh, and they were one time called Planet Labs, and they, now they just got the name Planet. That company was started by three engineers that came out of NASA Ames Center. And their whole business model is using many small spacecraft to provide 24 by 7, 365 coverage of the Earth. Their motto is, if you can't see it, you can't fix it. And they are using uh, most of their spacecraft for three U in size, and they're conducting amazing information. They're gathering a lot of good information, selling it. You know, some of their biggest customers are agribusiness because you know, agribusinesses are wanting to know uh, soil moisture and, you know, what's happening with the crops. And they're looking at uh, things that are going around the earth from drought and floods and things like that. And so uh, these agribusiness companies are buying data from this company that was started by three engineers from NASA Ames Research Center who have embraced three U size small spacecraft to conduct their business. So let's see, we'll go to... Um, the, the questions. Uh, in, here's one that's uh, in the case of reusable rockets, what is this effect on efficiency with modification of a used one? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, and uh, I would probably defer to Elon Musk <laughs> to answer that question. Uh, we were discussing this uh, you know, some years ago before Elon started showing that he's going to re recover his Falcon 9 boosters after they have uh, lit the third stage and the uh, the payload is going off into orbit and then bring the boosters back and of course you've seen those videos numbers of times but you always have to save an amount of fuel to do that and uh, bring that back because you got to burn the fuel when you're making your descent onto the surface and uh, you got to burn that to slow yourself down so you can land without crashing and we've always there were, I remember some engineers that were having to whether how how efficient is that and what is the cost of refurbishing that rocket then i i looked for a couple of papers on board to see if somebody had written anything like that but i haven't seen any yet and so if you come across one let me know because there's a trade-off every time uh, but i would like to add that you, you know what he's doing besides um that being a very sexy way and it's almost like a science fiction movie showing a rocket coming back and landing with pinpoint accuracy he's practicing landing on mars and uh, that's his objective because you may have heard elon musk say on more than one occasion that uh, he wants to go to mars and i have jokingly added in some of my presentations i've done on other college campuses and this is a quote from him he says um, Elon says, I want to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> so he is practicing landing on Mars every time you see one of those Falcon 9 boosters come back and do his pinpoint landing, whether they're doing it on land or even on the barge that's out in the ocean. Uh, I would like to go see uh, one of those one day. Uh, I, if you haven't been to a launch, uh, that's a bucket list item. It's, uh, it's kind of majestic to go see something like that, this roar and the sound and the subsonic waves you feel pass through your body if you're able to get close enough to see one of these behemoths, you will know, lift off from the face of the earth and put something into space. But it's, it's a good question. Um, 
And I, I think there's, I'm sure there's a business model paper that's been written on that about what is, you know, what is the cost of recovering your rocket versus just, you know, uh, doing one use and dumping it in the ocean as we've done in the past and too many times. Let's see another one. Uh, Debris in space is never good. How does NASA plan to locate as well as rectify the debris hitting other satellites and spacecraft? Oh, man. Uh, isn't that an issue? It is a terrible issue because you look at the growing number of spacecraft in space, and uh, we've already had news reports of collisions that have occurred already. Um, one of the Iridium spacecraft a few years ago collided with a Russian spacecraft and there was a cloud of debris with that. And um, I'm not even talking about the anti-satellite tests that have been conducted, you know, um, a couple by the U.S. and uh, one by China, uh, in which you, know, you get some clouds and debris from that. But people are becoming more and more concerned. And in the U.S., um, I think it's the Department of Commerce who has been handed that responsibility to start doing something about space traffic management just as we do on the surface of the earth and then the air around earth with the federal aviation administration managing traffic amongst uh, aircraft so that they also do not crash one, one another it's there is something to uh, there's an opportunity there uh, and we are still working on what is the best space traffic management model and we are starting to put on all of our spacecraft, you know, laser corner reflectors so that you can illuminate the spacecraft so you can get a better reading on this ephemera so you can track it better. And in um, many cases, in for these technology demonstrations that I conduct uh, with our, our small spacecraft, we try to get these out of orbit as fast as we can after the mission is done. And I'm sure we're going to start seeing more policy guidance from NASA on such missions that remove the spacecraft after you're done with a technology demonstration with um, the growing use of even the MEO, the middle uh, medium earth orbits, ones that GPS operates in and in a geosynchronous belt. As you know, as well as you well know, the geosynchronous belt is quite crowded too. And what um, governments would do in that area is that they would at the end of the life of the spacecraft, they would save enough propellant on board to move the spacecraft into what is the so-called graveyard, which is about four or 500 kilometers above the geosynchronous belt. Well, it's, we need to be more cognizant of the impact of our human endeavors on the environment, whether it's, not on, whether it's on the surface of the planet, land and ocean and in air, but as well as in space. It's, uh, I get this question regularly and I, it is of concern to a number of people, and I think it's going to take an international uh, effort to do something about it. And I know that there is some growing interest in doing something about it. I don't know if the United Nations Committee has been formed, but I think uh, sometimes we, we humans tend to be more reactive than proactive. Isn't that the case? And I wonder how many more collisions in space does it take? for us to become more aggressive and more proactive in addressing this problem because it's likely to become even more vexing in the near future than uh, we are seeing today. Okay, let's see. Uh, is there... Are there any technologies example to overcome such barriers, laws governing the universe in the near future, like reaching its speed of light? Uh, I, uh, uh, well, uh, Albert Einstein was right. No one's been able to disprove him yet. I know that the Breakthrough Foundation, if you've heard of them, uh, it's a uh, organization that's, um, the CEO is the Dr. Pete Warden, who is, uh, not only is he retired Air Force General, but he's also a retired NASA Center Director, and he's working with the Breakthrough Foundation, which is liberally funded by a few billionaires, uh, people like Yuri Milner and Al Zuckerberg, people like that, in which they're trying to build these um, tiny little spacecraft uh, in which you would uh, throw a number of them up into space, and then with a laser farm, uh, location TBD because this is all 
uh, just you know initial thinkings right now they would throw these small spacecraft up there and then hit them with lasers and try to accelerate them to sub light speed and the intent is to do a flyby of the alleged uh, earth size habitable zone planet around Proxima Centauri Alpha Centauri uh, and that's still sub light speed and do you think about that you know that's four and a half light years away and at one fifth speed of light you know it's 25 years or so to get out there and that's at speed and then you fly by and then uh, you take pictures of whatever you do with whatever tiny little instruments they have on board and then you transmit that back at speed of light and so 30 35 years you get the results of your flyby we don't have uh warp drives like star trek has uh, those science fiction things and those um make the jump to light speed they would say in star wars we're not capable of that right now i don't see the technology on the horizon at least not in my lifetime maybe one of the smart kids that's on this um, video teleconference today is going to develop that type of of uh, technology so uh we're just not there yet uh, but it reminds us that uh there is no plan b when it comes to our home planet uh mars is not a good um uh, example of a place you want to live because it'd be difficult to live on mars yeah i know people have been putting some thought into that about how you how would you terraform mars and i said that's not that's not easy to do uh there we don't have the capability to travel to any of even our stellar neighborhood earth-sized planets uh that i can see on the horizon so in the meantime we had better take care of this one because this is the only planet that we have right now that is within our reach so let's see what are some other questions um how do you handle the extreme pressure during emergency if you know that a plane is not safe and might crash any time i'm not sure uh, that was part of my lecture um what are the important things that we have to consider after designing a scientific payload for a cubesat you know the thing that um, is still uh, we're getting better at it is um, taking advantage of the launch vehicle spaces out there because there are a lot of rockets available now to get things into space. And sometimes it's a matter of matching up your spacecraft with a rocket that's going. And in some cases, you have a specific orbit in mind. And if there's a rocket that has space on board and they have some room for secondaries, they not be, may not be going to the orbit that you want to go. So in many cases, a lot of, uh, I see a lot of these universities and some of these other folks that are building spacecraft and they want to go in a particular orbit. And uh, sometimes they have to sit on a shelf as they're building a spacecraft when they're finished with it and waiting for the rocket it wants to go into the orbit that they want to get into. And I think it, it, the other part of this question, one of the important things we have to consider after designing a scientific payload for CubeSat is making sure that um, you uh, communications licenses is another area we uh, we find a little frustrating because more and more people are using the space environment for conducting their business or their scientific research and as more and more people are using it of course that fills up the electromagnetic spectrum when it comes to communication so one of the things you have to consider is what are your comm requirements in making sure you get your licensing processes in order as you are building your spacecraft? Because if you don't do that, you get to the end of the development of your spacecraft and you say, I'm ready to launch and I'm ready to conduct operations. And then someone's going to tell you, uh, no, because you don't have your communications licenses ready. So one of the things that I am constantly dealing with is making sure that the programs I'm working with have their comm licenses ready. And also finding a way to match them up to a launch vehicle that is taking them to the orbit that they want to get into. So that's two areas that um, we uh, are looking at <clears throat> that I would recommend that you pay attention to if you're building your spacecraft. Um, here's another one. What are your views on the blue dot picture having Earth, Moon in one picture? Um, that's a very emotional subject. Uh, or it's it's one that pulls at the heartstrings of what it means to be a human, and you may have seen uh, 
if you're interested in the writings of Carl Sagan, who was one of my personal heroes who passed away in the mid 1990s. And he lent his voice to some prose that describes that image as it was taken by Voyager as it was ending its original mission. And um, they were on the way to heading on out of the solar system. And he was the one who came up with the idea of turning Voyager camera back toward the Earth and doing what we could possibly call a long distance selfie. And uh, that image has been shared a number of times and it just shows how small we are. Uh, in the vast enveloping cosmos, and we're just a tiny speck. And uh, in, in that perspective, you know, all of our, uh, you, you can't see all of our troubles and all of our challenges on this planet, but it gives you an impression of our place in the universe. And it gives you an impression not only of that, but also how vast this cosmos is that we occupy. It's mind boggling. It's, it's hard for a lot of people to grasp the distances that we're talking about here because, you know, we, we too many people watch these science fiction movies uh, and come away with the idea that the technologies that are in there are, are going to be readily available in our lifetimes. And, um, and I love science fiction. Don't get me wrong. I love seeing, you know, watching these movies and also reading science fiction books. But that pale blue dot picture actually brings into perspective, you know, our... Uh, our place and how we should be respecting this planet. This is the only one we got uh, that is going to sustain us. Uh, and so I, I mentioned this a little earlier in this presentation, but talking about that, it's, uh, and we will do it again. Um, we did it with Kepler at the end, even though that wasn't a pale blue dot, it was a, a bright reflection coming off the Earth at a distance of 94 million miles. And then, of course, Voyager, with its photograph, that's the farthest we have um, been in which we've done, a, a, if you will, a selfie of ourselves. But uh, it, it always helps to do that. And matter of fact, when Carl Sagan suggested doing that with the Voyager 1 spacecraft, he got pushback from members of his team who said, why would you want to do that? There's no scientific value added in it. He said, no, there is. It, it, there's a cultural and social uh, value in doing that, as it also represents humanity and our perspective on um, the where we are in this universe. Let's see and some other ones. Is NASA developing any fuel for long journey of spacecraft to missions? Yeah, we're we're still working on a number of things that. Uh, uh, beyond our capabilities today. I mean, a number of the small satellite technology partnerships that we have awarded are addressing fuel needs, but they're mainly for just for small spacecraft. But yes, NASA has, uh, we're still investing in uh, thermal nuclear rocketry, uh, nuclear propellants for rockets. Uh, and one time it dropped and I think it's back again. Uh, it's not an area that I work in, uh, but I know that uh, if you go look into the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Group and even within the Space Technology Mission Directorate, there are a number of efforts aimed at uh, technologies to improve our propulsion capabilities so that we can get eventually faster than what we do now with just uh, the, the traditional chemical propellants. Of course, uh, we have nuclear payloads on a number of uh, our missions that we've flown in the past, but they weren't used for propulsion. Voyager 1, Voyager 2, the Pioneers, they all have nuclear uh, power plants on board, but they were not used for propulsion. But NASA is look, looking at uh, nuclear power plants for propulsion for um, uh, interplanetary travel in the future. Let's see. Uh, is there a scope to use the waste on Earth as fuel in any way? Um, I'm sure some people think about it. I'm not aware of any efforts in NASA that are uh, looking at that. Uh, that would be interesting to do because I think there's, there's a, humans are clever and they can sometimes come up with some uh, wild ideas about how do we use things that we discard and how do we use things that are 
uh, is, we consider as waste and uh, take advantage of that and see if there's a way that we can uh, make use of stuff in the past that we have thrown away. But uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head in which that effort's going on, but it could be, there's could be some small startups out there that are looking at that. Let's see with some more. Okay, here's a good one. On what basis are we saying that the life sustainable planets are found? What resources did we find there? Uh, we just sort of, uh, uh, and, and we had to be simplistic in this. And I've, I've talked with Bill Baruki and Natalie Battaglia and some of the other scientists that were on Kepler. And uh, I, we discussed, you know, what does it mean to call a world habitable in this case? And the response was this, well, we, we have to use a, a definition so that we can narrow the search in and what they, uh, they here's where we were, re, once again, mirror imaging ourselves on the rest of the universe. So we said, uh, earth size habitable zone, what does habitable zone mean? In this case, it was that area where you get the right amount of sunlight so that water might pool on the surface of the planet. And so is that insulation factor they were talking about. Now, we know that water is a vital ingredient for life, at least as we know it on this planet. And there is uh, that trap we could fall into. With what if life develops in a different way than we expect? What if there is life that has devolved uh, or uh, developed and evolved somewhere else in the cosmos is unlike anything we've seen here. Uh, we discussed that and Bill Baruchi says, well, as many times some scientists proceed with the known before they can get to the unknown. So the, it was a simplistic uh, use of a habitable zone that we were using in detecting the planets that Kepler found. Uh, we just used the Earth model. Uh, and we, knowing that water is vital for us, that one discovery by using Hubble and Spitzer to point at the Kepler K218b planet in which they confirm water vapor in the atmosphere of that planet. I had an interesting conversation a number of years ago uh, with a Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn. I don't know if you're familiar with her work. Um, but she won a Nobel Prize in her work on human longevity and looking at uh, how, how, what is the aging process when you evaluate it in the terms of a human lifespan and what causes us to age. And she was looking at telomeres and telomerase and the impact of that enzyme on telomeres and the fraying of your chromosomes. And we happened to run across each other at a convention and we started talking. I was interested in her work and she was interested in Kepler. And she had this very insightful question. And she said, what if we come across life that's based upon something other than carbon? And I said, like what? Like, you know, like silicon or boron? And she said, yes. And I said, well, it, it's the, the thing we run into is that um, carbon combines so easily with other molecules. And, uh, and likely, um, we're, if, if and when we do encounter life elsewhere, it's likely to be carbon-based. I mean, look at this planet. Uh, it's all carbon-based here. And so you look at it from a statistical perspective. I'm not saying it doesn't evolve in other ways in other places, but at least on this planet, you, we have the abundance and diversity of life that is carbon-based. And you know, look how much DNA we share with all the other creatures on this planet. So uh, it's uh, back to your original question. Um, what uh, it, it's, you know, habitable zone planets, it was, it's a simplistic um, view, uh, but that's what we use. We had to start somewhere. And so we took a simplistic view of what does it mean to be habitable? And eventually I'm hoping that some generation that comes behind us, they will um, be able to um, uh, image some of these planets and actually, you know, find out what's on the surface of them. Here's a question that says, what are your views regarding the Fermi paradox? Wow. Um, that's a great question. Um, and it's debated among astronomers all the time. I'm not an astronomer. My background is math and physics. But I, I've always been found these debates and these discussions rather interesting. And if you're familiar with the Fermi paradox, and it goes something like this. Well, if 
if life is teeming throughout the cosmos, then why haven't we had confirmed detection of that life or why haven't they detected us? Well, that's a really good question. Um, and hence, you, it, that's why it is a paradox. You, why is it? Maybe if there is an alien life form out there and maybe they're so different from us that they are not able to contact us or maybe you think of it this way. Maybe we are so uninteresting to them that we're so primitive, they don't want to talk to us. There's all kinds of answers, uh, or I should say answers, all kinds of speculations on that question. Um, and I've, I've gotten this at a couple of other events, and it's, it's a matter of how much wine do you have? <laughs> we can sit and talk about this subject for a while. It's, uh, and I would love, and you see these movies that talk about this, you know, the movie Contact, because you see one of the scientists in there, and, um, and I don't think it's uh, Sarah Seeger, it's one of the other scientists who, she was interviewed for um, her uh, expertise on extraterrestrial life, because well, she worked at SETI at a time when they made the movie Contact back in the late 1990s. And in that one, they finally did have contact with an alien species and the information was transmitted to us. And we were based upon the movie and also the book, we're able to conduct, uh, construct a contraption to actually make contact with them for the first time. But that's a movie. But when it comes to, will we ever make contact with an alien life? Or, I don't know. Um, uh, of course you see, <laughs> a number of people out there saying, I've been abducted by aliens, and so we know they're here. You know, well, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, if you're familiar with him, he's gotten this question before, and uh, he his answer I thought was spot on. He says, well, those of you who say that you've been abducted by an alien in his first contact, then uh, while you're up there and he's probing you, make sure you bring back his ashtray because you need to have clear and indisputable evidence. <laughs> that you have had contact with an alien but the we occupy a galaxy that is a hundred thousand light years across there are 200 billion stars estimated in this galaxy and the distances are so vast and we are a, a primitive uh, society in the sense that we are incapable of interstellar travel we're barely able to make planetary travel today so uh, i it's a question that's going to continue to vex us, and I'm sure you have your own thoughts on the Fermi paradox itself. Let's see what some other ones. What are your views on the Dyson sphere? Is this proposition fictional or a distant reality? Dyson spheres, if you're familiar with that, it's an indication of a of a, a very advanced civilization that would build an apparatus around a star and. Uh, 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 use all the energy coming off that star for the benefit of the society. You know, there was a uh, one of the scientists on Kepler uh, actually got a grant of, of uh, I think he got $250,000 to study the Kepler data to see if they could find evidence of a Dyson sphere in the Kepler data. And uh, there was uh, interesting articles that came out within the last year in which they were uh, some speculation that one of the stars that were referred to in the Kepler data as Tabitha star was um, there was a, a brief titillating uh, information that went across the astro astronomical community saying, hey, maybe we found a Dyson sphere, but they had no evidence of it. It was just uh, interesting data they were seeing in, in the light curves around this star that were they could not explain. Now, just because you can't explain it doesn't mean you should jump to the conclusion that there's a Dyson sphere. Uh, and this is speculation by a number of, of scientists that alien citizens would, uh, alien races, alien civilizations would be able to build such a thing. So it's still in the realm of science fiction. Uh, if you, if that scientist who did get a grant to study the Kepler data to determine is there a Dyson sphere in it, uh, one, how do you prove it? Um, how do you, besides a, a light curve, how would you, in, with, with that data and with that information, prove beyond indisputable doubt that there's a Dyson sphere out there? So it's still in the realm of, of science fiction at this time. And uh, basically, I don't know if anyone will ever be able to prove it, but it's an interesting thing to talk about. 
uh, what are sorry to interrupt yes. i guess no i guess there can never be an end to the questions but def- unfortunately we- hello so uh, we shall so i guess uh, we are there are no end to the questions so we are and unfortunately we are short of time now okay so we should conclude the session all right thank you okay, so much so for having me today it's been a pleasure uh, presenting to you and, and and trying my best to answer your questions thank you so much first of all i would like to thank roger for giving his valuable time and to deliver such a great and informative session on technologies used in small spacecraft and mission kepler at the same time letting us know the details thing details of things from nasa's point of view and i'm pretty sure that this session would have brought many of our childhood dreams come true we definitely look forward to have you sir with us in the near future now i would like to call darshan dalwadi sir branch con- branch council of ieee bvmsp to say a few words okay first of all i want to thank mr roger hunters sir for such a informative session it surely help everyone learn something new i thank our principal dr ayan patel sir for supporting us and today our host himanshu thakur along with the moderators which maintain our youtube live channels to pass on the question to the chat box that mr dhru pokar and ibrahim koicha for handling everything during the session to make it effective i would like to thank team ieee bbm for organizing this event and all of the dear participants without whom we would not be able to spread knowledge uh i would like to thank also engineer ketan patel sir uh, bvm alumni to attend the session from usa thank you very much sir i hope everyone enjoy the sessions and we will meet soon again in our next session tomorrow tomorrow we have two session the first session at 11 am uh, on the t- title of data analytics by mr venkat raju from university of california so 11 to 12:30 pm the first session second session on machine learning for solar energy by dr andrewich from russia time is 5 pm to 6:30 pm so stay home stay safe thank you thank you thank you sir and thank you everyone for joining in us and we are sure we'll see you tomorrow in our next session thank you thank you so much